Hello, I'm Oliver and this is Deep Cuts, a channel dedicated to music for lovers of music. First off, I just quickly want to say I apologise for how tired I look in this video. Uh, bags, hair, puffy eyes. Um, it's been a really long week, so <laughs> I apologise for looking like a reanimated corpse. So first off, thanks to everyone who voted for this video. This video is for you guys and for anyone else who's interested in the man. Um, for those of you that voted for Radiohead, don't worry, we will get around to that little circle jerk at some point in the future. So as most of you know, the poet, novelist, singer-songwriter, musician Leonard Cohen sadly passed away a couple of weeks ago at the age of 82. He is one of the most prominent and distinguished musicians in the history of popular music. His influence is undeniable across so many different artists. His poetry is, is up there with some of the, some of the best poets. It's, it's not just about his music, it's, in fact it's more about his lyricism and his poeticism than it is his music. So I will be focusing a lot on lyrics today because I think that's a really important part of, of what the man did. Now, I'm not going to bother with any more hyperbole, let's just get straight into it. Leonard Cohen was born in September of 1934 in Canada into a comfortable middle-class Jewish family. His father died when he was nine, but he remained very close to his mother and sister throughout his life. I'd, if you'd be interested in learning a little bit more about his early upbringing, I'd suggest checking out his first novel, The Favourite Game, which he published in 1963. He grew up knowing in his head he wanted to say something both to and about the world, and he had a vision of himself as a writer, as his means of doing this. Cohen was interviewed by the BBC in 1988, and he had this to say to them about his connection with language. I've been touched by the language of the Bible, and the power of language seemed to touch me so deeply. When my father died, my only response was to take on one of his bow ties, cut it in half, and put some kind of message into the bow tie, some kind of poem, and bury it in the back garden. So the connection with language and survival was somehow very clear and acute to me. He actually started as a writer, as he'd intended to when he was younger. He wrote a novel and poetry volumes as well before he actually decided to cut a country record, which he decided to do to make some money, because he wasn't making enough money from being a writer. It's quite a refreshing, pragmatic approach to getting into the music industry, isn't it? You know, you hear so many stories of, I, you know, trying to overcome the odds regardless of economic pressure, yet there's this person that's just going, I'm going to make some money out of this, basically. <laughs> so <laughs> it's quite an interesting insight to the man, I think. At this point, it's worth looking at the beautiful, lyrical quality of his poetry. It has a brevity and a heft, but at the same time a lightness, like a sense of humour and a knowing wink. Beneath my hands, your small breasts are the upturned bellies of breathing fallen sparrows. Wherever you move, I hear the sounds of closing wings, of falling wings. He had a real interest in Federico Garcia Lorca, who was a poet, and he even dedicated his later track, Take This Waltz, to him. Now, if you read some of Lorca's poetry, I think you can see some of those grains of influence in Cohen's own writing. Never let me lose the marvel of your statue-like eyes, or the accent, the solitary rose of your breath, places on my cheek at night. He didn't want to sing, he wanted to be a songwriter for other people. Um, but he, you know, Songs like Suzanne, which he wrote for Judy Collins, that was a hit for her previously. Uh, and one night, Judy actually pulled him on stage and forced him to sing Suzanne in front of the crowd. And the crowd went absolutely wild, but a minute in, he was shaking so much from nerves, he said, oh, I can't do this, and just walked off stage. And the crowd went so crazy that he came back on and, and finished the performance in the end. Um, but that, that's kind of how it began, with a, with a little push from a friend. <laughs> Cohen told his lawyer at the time that he couldn't sing, and his lawyer replied with, I don't think of you guys as singers, you're about telling stories and telling the truth to as many people as possible. And that is the beginning of Leonard Cohen's story, his journey as a travelling musician spanning decades across the world. So his first album, Songs of Leonard Cohen, was released in December of 1967. As previously mentioned, Cohen's song Suzanne was already a hit for Judy Collins, previously being released on her album My Life. And Cohen used that track as the opening for his first album and also his debut single. Uh, what a way to kick off a musical career. Probably one of Cohen's most beloved songs in his entire discography. The world was introduced to the man with gentle Spanish guitar, lilting backing vocals, and a commanding yet comforting vocal delivery from the man himself. The opening lyrics epitomise the style and mode of Leonard Cohen's art. Lusty, romantic, 
witty but full of truth and life. Suzanne takes you down to her place near the river. You can hear the boats go by. You can spend the night beside her and you know that she's half crazy, but that's why you want to be there. Suzanne was a dancer from Montreal who came to know a lot of the beat poets of the 60s as well as people like Leonard Cohen. There's a really interesting interview the BBC did with Suzanne herself in 98 where she talks about her portrayal in the song Suzanne. A really interesting read if you fancy it, I'll put the link in the description. The other very well-known track in this album is So Long Marianne, another song about his experience with a woman. Surprise, surprise. Leonard and Marianne met on the Greek island of Hydra in 1960. Uh, at this point, Leonard was there because he was renting an apartment for $14 a month which was pretty shit by all accounts and he had intermittent electricity problems and it was one of the only apartments on the entire island that didn't have a view of the sea. <laughs> so it's pretty crap to be honest. But it was one of the places where he penned some of his most famous poems and songs. They were together for seven years, living and travelling together until they eventually split in 1966. Apparently Cohen was heartbroken by the split and his feeling about their connection is painfully recounted in the lyrics of So Long Marianne. We met when we were almost young, deep in the green lilac park. You held on to me like I was a crucifix as we went reeling through the dark. The bleakness of life is so prolific in that last line and such powerful imagery of, of a lover like a candle in the dark. Marianne died earlier this year and Cohen wrote this final letter to her. Well Marianne, it's come to this time when we are really so old and our bodies are falling apart and I think I will follow you very soon. Know that I am so close behind you that if you stretch out your hand, I think you can reach mine. Jeez, that gets no easier to read, does it? Cohen's first album is masterful and beautiful throughout. I know I've only talked about two tracks, but there's so much to get stuck into. You should just go and listen to this as a starting point. It's the beginning of his career, so it's a good place to start anyway. Check out one of my favorite tracks, The Master Song, which is the second track on the album, which has this brilliant chord progression at the beginning that I absolutely love. Definitely an essential go and listen. By the time his follow-up Songs From A Room is released in 1969, Cohen finds himself in quite a bleak place. You know, he's still very heartbroken from losing his loved one, and as a result, the tracks here are much more stripped back and bare than the first album, Songs For Leonard Cohen. Cohen himself had this to say about Songs From A Room. I did start to break down at that time. There is a certain bleak quality to that record. I don't think they are bad qualities for a singer, incidentally. I think that everybody lives a life of the heart and everybody knows what it's like to crack out and I think we cherish it in our singers when they manifest that experience in song. The back of the record is famously a photo of Marianne sitting at the writing desk in his apartment in Hydra uh, where he wrote many of his songs including Bird on a Wire. Probably one of the most iconic opening lines in musical history, Cohen croons like a bird on the wire like a drunk in a midnight choir. I have tried in my way to be free. Chris Christopherson has admitted to wanting these lines on his gravestone, to which Cohen replied, I would be offended if you didn't. The tender, almost twee instrumentation here almost hides the cutting lyricism. Just listen to this line. Like a baby stillborn, like a beast with his horn, I have torn everyone who reached out for me. That's tough stuff. Another standout track is The Story of Isaac, where Cohen juxtaposes the biblical with the political issues of the present, in his own words. There is a story in the Bible about Isaac, how his father summoned him to go and climb a mountain, how his father built an altar there after he had been commanded to offer up his son. And just at the last moment before he was about to sacrifice Isaac, an angel held the hand of the father but today the children are being sacrificed and no one raises a hand to end the sacrifice. And this is what this song is about. I like the fact that this is an anti-war song, yet it's a little bit more general about all the wars that we've gone through as a society since the beginning of time, as opposed to being specifically a protest song about any kind of present war that was going on. It's a bit more general than that. It's the fact that, you know, war, what is war? Why does war even happen? You know, it's a more general state about life and suffering is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Other standout tracks on this album are Seems So Long Ago, Nancy, and also The Old Revolution. Again, really good stuff. Not as, not as strong as his first record, but certainly an interesting follow-up with some real classic tracks on there. 
Then in 1971, we get the final album in the Songs trilogy, Songs of Love and Hate. This saw Cohen at an even darker point in his life, which is very clearly shown on the opening track, Avalanche. This track is based on one of Cohen's poems, I Stepped Into an Avalanche, and the whole thing is so washed out and downtrodden, desolate in the deepest sense of the word, where some of his earlier tracks like Bird on a Wire and Suzanne feel heartfelt and tender, the insistent starkness of this track just bores into you. The starkness on this track is an allusion to what you will experience throughout the rest of the album. Battered, bleak, yet beautiful. In 71, the record wasn't initially received very well by people. I think a lot of people were hoping for some more sing-along songs like Suzanne and So Long Marianne, and what they got was something a lot darker and a lot more difficult to digest. It's funny that that darkness turns some people off, I think, but actually, as I hope I've already illustrated, there was already a darkness existing in Cohen's lyricism, just he takes it to another whole different level on this record. Third Cut Dress Rehearsal Rag is one of my favourite tracks on this album. It's so dark. It's, it's got a protagonist in it that's seriously contemplating suicide as he feels his senses dissipating around him. Don't drink from that cup. It's caked and cracked along the rim. That's not the electric light, my friend. That is your vision growing dim. Interesting point about this lyricism. I did the Nick Cave guide a few months ago and we talked about the mercy seat. I think you can see Cohen's clear influence on Nick Cave with this lyricism. You know, this idea of um, a man's psyche failing but noticing it through little minute objects surrounding him. Really fascinating stuff, but I think you can really see where the Mercy Seat was influenced by that. Cohen's guitar performance is more jangling and rattling than on the previous two LPs, which really helps mirror his anguished vocal performance. The darkness does have a theatricality to it as well, including children's choir and also string sections intermittently. Even more jangly, upbeat tracks like Diamonds in the Mine have a venom to them. You know, Cohen's spitting those vocals out, and it really jars against honky-tonk piano, bluegrass guitar, and soulful vocals. Just look at the lyrics that he's snarling here. Ah, there's no comfort in the covens of the witch. Some very clever doctor went and sterilized the bitch. And the only man of energy, yes, the revolution's pride, he trained a hundred women just to kill an unborn child. The entire record only has eight tracks, but it clocks in at 44 minutes. It's very heavy, complex stuff, this record. And I can see why it initially would have probably turned people off when it came out in 71, but to me this might be one of Cohen's best records. Bleak, dark, all-encompassing and captivating. In 73, Live Songs was released, which was a collection of live cuts from his last three records, uh, with Mr. Cohen supporting the Convict look. Check out this release if you do get the chance because there's some beautiful renditions of the story of Isaac, Bird on a Wire, and also Passing Through, among others. Then, in 1974, Leonard releases his fourth LP, New Skin for the Old Ceremony, and hires producer John Lizau, who effectively helps reinvent the sonic footprint of Cohen's music. Everything is lush, more instrumentally dense, yet nothing takes away from the original impact of the sound that people fell in love with, which is Cohen's voice, and his guitar. Opening track Is This What You Wanted is a deftly constructed track with linear drum patterns, panned horns, and confident bass lines that, that juxtapose against sections with Cohen's vocals and guitar. There's definitely a more airy, lighter mood on this record than Songs of Love and Hate. Not that that would be particularly difficult to achieve. Chelsea Hotel Number no. 2 is a brilliantly fluttering, melancholic track with Cohen's vocals and guitar at the forefront of the song, with slight string instrumental embellishment throughout. This track is actually about a sexual encounter he had with Janis Joplin. It's a fact that he accidentally let slip in an interview some years later and then apologised for his indiscretions because, as he said, that shouldn't have been something that was revealed, uh, you know, to the world. Despite some of the more graphic lines in the song, Cohen inevitably reveals his worn heart and a level of self-deprecation. I remember you well in the Chelsea Hotel. You were famous, your heart was a legend. You told me again you preferred handsome men, but for me you would make an exception. This album exhibits a newly born Cohen. I think that most of that is embodied in his vocal performance, which was very anguished and ragged 
on Songs of Love and Hate, and it now feels like it has a renewed confidence. It's backed up by the instrumentation that John Lizal's provided, but it just has a bit more of a vigour to it, as signs that maybe things aren't quite as terrible at this point as they were in 71. Another interesting track to listen to is Field Commander Cohen, a track about a spy dropping acid into people's drinks at a cocktail party. Uh, there's, uh, there's these glissando strings at the end of the track that, that have like a spy bond feel to them, but they also sound a little bit like the ending of Radiohead's daydreaming track off of their this, uh, this year's album, Moonshape Pool, which just reminds me of those glissandoing strings that are kind of ominous, but they have like a, a, a Bondian style to them. Do you think Bondian's a word? I just made that one up. There's a bit of a dichotomy of opinion towards this record. Some people feel like Lizelle's production drowns out Cohen's sound, and other people, like myself, feel that the embellishments just add a little bit of vitality to the music that's being made. Go and listen to it and see what side you're on. But I think when you listen to the follow up album, which is 1977's Death of a Ladies Man, you'll see that Lizelle's production was effective and very different to what happens on Death of a Ladies Man. And for some reason, despite the success of pairing Lizal with Cohen, Cohen's manager decided to pair Cohen with Phil Spector, the creator of the Wall of Sound recording noise for Death of a Ladies Man. Boy oh boy did it result in a bad record. This record is probably widely considered Cohen's worst record and it's not difficult to see why. Listen to the first two tracks and you, it's just awfully bloated. Now Cohen's drowned out, you can barely hear what's going on. Um, there's just all of this garish, awful instrumentation that Phil Spector's thrown in there. Just awful. Whereas Lizal's production flourishes were, in my opinion, tasteful, Spectre literally throws everything at the wall. Oh, the wall of sound, wall. Great joke. It's a stupid marriage of talents, really. You've got Phil Spector, one of the most theatrical, over-the-top producers, paired with one of the most emotional, sensitive songwriters. Makes no sense at all. Underneath the cringe-worthy 50s doo-wop of memories, uh, that reveals a very fascinating lyricism underneath all of that crap, which is really worth looking at. Frankie Lane, he was singing Jezebel. I pinned an iron cross to my lapel. I walked up to the tallest and the blondest girl. I said, look, you don't know me now, but very soon you will. So won't you let me see? I said, won't you let me see? I said, won't you let me see your naked body? This song has so much to say about the racial tension left over from World War II, you know, the residual effects of that, but also attitudes towards women in the 1970s. So there's, there's some brilliance to unlock here. It would have just been great with just vocal and guitar. That would have done, Phil. You didn't need to add all the doo-wop and the backing vocals just wasn't needed. <laughs> In 79, Cohen released Recent Songs, which was a slight return to form. He worked with Joni Mitchell's producer, Henry Louis. As a result, the tracks are more stripped back, as you would expect with someone who's worked with Joni Mitchell. Um, so it didn't have that cringe-worthy overproduction that's Phil Spector created on Death for Ladies Man. But it, it wasn't, it's not just a throwback to some of his earlier work, it has an Eastern and a Mediterranean influence to the instrumentation and the songwriting. Here we find performances on the Oud, one of these, uh, Gypsy Violin, and even the inclusion of a Mexican mariachi band. These inclusions act in a similar way to what Lizur managed to do on New Skin. It embellishes the writing, it doesn't overpower it like Spectre. I'm gonna stop shitting on Spectre though, I feel bad that I'm uh, really ripping into him. But that album is crap. These instrumental touches add a new flavour to Cohen's songwriting, uh, uh, specifically on the track The Guest, which has this um, spidery violin solo and agitated mariachi guitar picking. Despite this being an interesting listen, I wouldn't say this was an essential record in Cohen's canon, but it's definitely worth seeking out once you've listened to some of the more essential records, and it will give you a taste of where Cohen was beginning to experiment with his sound and change the sonic influences in ways that he would continue to do so and hit a real peak with in the decades to come. Now we hit a fairly inactive period in Cohen's musical output, instead choosing to focus on his volume of poetry, Book of Mercy, uh, spend time with his children in the south of France, and also work on a number of musical films, both for cinema and for television. At this point, Cohen's musical career had hit a bit of a lull in popularity. I mean, if you consider the fact that Death of a Ladies Man was pretty widely disliked, and it was a bit of an indifference towards recent songs. The last successful album he'd had out was 74's New Skin for the Old Ceremony. A full decade after New Skin was released, 
in 84, Cohen releases various positions with John Lazar back at the production helm again. Also accompanying Cohen on this album is Jennifer Warnes, a singer-songwriter who had had quite a lot of success in the 80s. She actually goes on to collaborate with Cohen intermittently throughout the rest of his career. In 87, Warnes actually released a cover album of songs that Cohen had written called Famous Blue Raincoat, and it's said to have been certainly part of the reason for Cohen's popularity kicking back off again. It was, it was part of that. He, she's been in some interviews and she was really adamant that Cohen would to be appreciated by the public, specifically America, because in the US he's never had the kind of popularity that he has in Europe and Canada. And she, want, you know, she wanted people to appreciate his music again. So her being able to team up with him on various positions as well as releasing an album of covers of his songs was her way of doing that. And Cohen has called her a great friend for sticking by him in his, you know, a time where he really needed her. Columbia actually refused to even release various positions to the US public. They claimed that it, it wasn't going to be commercially viable for them, which is really ridiculous when you consider the fact that this album contains Hallelujah, not just one of Cohen's most famous songs, but probably one of the most famous songs of all time. That lack of popularity in the US that I was just discussing, you know, I think uh, Columbia saw that, that various positions was having some success in other countries and they did eventually release it in 1990, but that is after his 88 album. So it took him a long time to actually finally add that to Cohen's US release canon. One of the real noticeable differences on this record is Cohen's voice. It had dropped a minor third since recent songs were released, and Cohen said this himself. My voice had gotten very, very deep over the years and seems to be even deepening. I thought it was because of 50,000 cigarettes and several swimming pools of whiskey that my voice has gotten low. His renewed deep voice is accompanied on this record with cheap synthesizers, which is altogether something completely new in Cohen's instrumental canon, and also things like pedal steel guitar on the track Hunter's Lullaby. Cohen was quoted saying that this record was the first time I could really see and intuitively feel what I was doing, making or creating in that enterprise. After a long period of barrenness, it all just seemed to click. Opening track Dance Me to the End of Love is a strangely captivating track. It has some of that gypsy sway left over from recent songs, uh, but with the addition of the Casio keyboard gives it this, this kitsch, slightly skewed quality in a good way. Closing track If It Be Your Will is a morose ballad with Spanish guitar, airy Casio synthesizers and Cohen crooning his rewritten prayer. And draw us near and bind us tight, all your children here in their rags of light, in our rags of light, all dressed to kill and end this night if it be your will. I'm not going to talk about Hallelujah because we all know Hallelujah, don't we? So after a number of successful tours following various positions and a renewed popularity in countries from Europe as well as America, Cohen releases 1988's I'm Your Man, a record that completely reinvents his music. I mean, we are talking about a complete reinvention here. I know so that albums like Recent Songs and Various Positions have a, la a level of experimentation in them that moves on his songwriting from his early period, but this is entirely different. Yes, it's Leonard Cohen's electro pop album. No, no, don't freak out, it's a good thing. Uh, yeah, it sounds terrible on paper, but this actually is one of Leonard Cohen's greatest albums, if not his greatest album. Apparently the big sonic change can largely be attributed to Cohen's state of mind. Gone here are the biblical allusions on various positions, and there's a renewed stoicism in his songwriting. He actually felt that if these pieces were recorded on only vocals and guitar, that they would be almost intolerable to listen to, as well as for him to play. His words, not mine. For instance, imagine these lyrics from opening track First We Take Manhattan without the stomping disco beat and rhythmic backing vocals. I don't like your fashion business, mister, and I don't like these drugs that keep you thin. I don't like what happened to my sister. First we take Manhattan, then we take Berlin. It would feel so downbeat without that disco beat that you'd probably string yourself up whilst you listen to it. Third track Everybody Knows is a deeply pessimistic song detailing the prevailing symptoms of humanity, including entrenched racism, old black Joes still picking cotton for your ribbons and bows, and everybody knows. The AIDS epidemic? And everybody knows that the plague is coming. 
Everybody knows that it's moving fast and the general unfairness of life. Everybody knows that the dice are loaded. Everybody rolls with their fingers crossed. Yet where this fatalism idea comes into play is the humour that is also introduced into this lyricism. For example, everybody knows that you love me, baby. Everybody knows that you really do. Everybody knows that you've been faithful. Ah, give or take a night or two. Everybody knows you've been discreet. But there were so many people you just had to meet without your clothes. And everybody knows. This, coupled with the insistent repetition of everybody knows, creates a juxtaposition of difficult themes and wry, ironic chuckling. It just creates something complex yet utterly brilliant. The marching staccato strings and bubbling bass join Cohen in such a harmonious way. The whole thing feels very cinematic. It's so very fully realised, the entire sonic scape of this track. And, and for me, the rest of the tracks on the album feel the same. And I've spent a really long time there unpacking one song on this record. It's just a brilliant record. You have to go and listen to it and really live all these songs and make sure you read the lyrics whilst you're listening to the album. I think that's, that's the same to be said for all of Cohen's music. If you're really going to get into his music, you need to you know, listen to those lyrics whilst you're listening to it, read them alongside it, because that's what makes him so fascinating as an artist, a songwriter, a poet. I just love the cohesive style of this record, the anachronistic synths, exuberant backing vocals, cinematic strings, and that guttural vocal from Leonard Cohen. Brilliant. Go and listen to this masterpiece ASAP. He did a huge tour of the world following the release of I'm Your Man, which really properly renewed his popularity in the US. As a side note, check out this incredible version of Hallelujah that he did on the 88 tour. Link in the description. So let's hit 1992, the year of my birth, a pointless side note, and a 58-year-old Leonard Cohen releases ninth LP, The Future. By all accounts, a brilliant follow-up to 88's I'm Your Man. He's still tackling big themes with his guttural growl on this record, yet the electro-pop focus has taken a bit of a back seat. However, the instrumentation from that electro-pop has permitted a vitality and an energy back into this music. It's a bit like the ability to use that kind of songwriting on I'm Your Man completely opened up Cohen's songwriting to new possibilities. So that vitality and energy recovered from I'm Your Man still exists in the future, just in a different sonic form. But the energy and the feeling of that music is still there. The gorgeous organ solo on track B For Real is the musical cherry on top for me. It has It's a piano ballad track with these exquisite guitar flourishes throughout the track. Just beautiful. Those serious themes are displayed on title track The Future, a lamentation of our decaying society. Give me crack and anal sex. Take the only tree that's left and stuff it up the hole in your culture. Give me back the Berlin Wall. Give me Stalin and St. Paul. I've seen the future, brother. It is murder. One of the best tracks here is Democracy, a marching band epic where Cohen is discussing moving forward into the future and trying to build on the horrific experiences that we faced in the 20th century. It's coming through a crack in the wall on a visionary flood of alcohol from the staggering account of the Sermon on the Mount, which I don't pretend to understand at all. It's coming from the silence on the dock of the bay, from the brave the bold, the battered, heart of Chevrolet. Democracy is coming to the USA. I think it's clear to see that capitalism is being poked at as well in that, you know, from the Chevrolet lyric and all that sort of thing. And um, so some people read this as a blindly optimistic track, but I think if you look a little bit further, it doesn't take much to show the, the wry humour and the fatalism once again on display in Cohen's songwriting. Check out the live version of Democracy performed on Jules Holland in the UK around the time. I'll, I'll link link that in the description below. It's got such an energy to it. It's a really great version. I think it's the first time I heard this track um, on that live performance video. So yeah, definitely check that out. So Leonard Cohen's personal life takes a bit of a turn in the 90s. And in 96, he is officially ordained as a Buddhist Japanese Zen monk. Boy, did this guy have an interesting life. He actually got into Buddhism way back in the 70s. So remember when I was suggesting that he was sporting the convict look on 73's live songs? That might have something to do with the Buddhism thing in hindsight.
He spent much of the 1990s in a Zen Buddhist center in California and didn't return to his musical career until 2001's 10 New Songs, which was co-written and produced by Sharon Robinson, pictured on the cover. This is a bit of a strange release in Cohen's canon. It's kind of a minor record, really, but I have a soft spot for its gentle tactfulness and it's, its nighttime mood that's created through Sharon's instrumentation and Cohen's once again deepened voice. So at this point, Cohen's voice is low. His vocal range is way more limited than 92's The Future, but it doesn't matter one bit because that his languorous flow perfectly suits the melancholic haze of tracks on offer on 10 new songs. I think the best way to describe this record is sultry and intimate. First track in My Secret Life has low synth organ, sequenced electronic drums, and Sharon Robinson's backing vocals that are really beautifully soulful in themselves. And I think just reducing the framework really, it cushions Cohen's battered voice. It provides like a skeletal framework that's very intimate, but it just, it just, it cushions everything in a heedful way. So his voice is still center stage and the whole thing just works together very well. Robinson actually did tour with Cohen in the late 70s and she goes on to tour with him between 2008 and 2013. But this album is her biggest contribution to Cohen's music. I swear that Cohen's own deep rumbly voice can be felt in your own throat when you listen to Boogie Street. It's a track with almost trip hoppy drums and funky synth bass, which is it's, it's interesting, it's nice. It's something completely different that adds to his canon of music. Then in 2004, he releases Dear Heather. It's a real mishmash of ideas, not particularly cohesive, but it's unsurprising when you realize that some of the tracks are left over from the sessions from Sharon Robinson, some of it is adaptations of poetry from the 80s, and the last track on the album is a live cover of the popular country song Tennessee Waltz. I would definitely suggest not starting here if you're new to Leonard Cohen. This really is a record for the completists, for the big fans. It's not it's it's not a brilliant album. It's it's a collection of interesting ideas and outtakes, really. Having said that, Villanelle for Our Time is a intriguing spoken word performance uh, where eventually the instrumentation joins Cohen with languid piano notes, brushed drums, and dusty double bass that creates a really nice atmosphere. We rise, we rise to play a greater part, reshaping narrow law and art, whose symbols are the millions slain. From bitter searching of the heart, we rise to play a greater part. Very poignant and probably my favourite thing on this album. And so for a pretty long time, people considered Dear Heather to be Cohen's swan song. Not so. After an ordeal of harassment and a subsequent suit towards longtime manager Kelly Lynch, Cohen was found pretty much penniless despite the insistent decades of touring and releasing albums. Don't worry, they put the woman in jail, but she wasn't actually ordered to pay Cohen back for any of these earnings that she'd squandered. So what did Leonard Cohen do? Came out of retirement, put on a load of live shows so he could make some money. Those tours that he did between sort of 2007 and, and 2011, um, he made a lot of money off of those. And I think in 2009 alone, he made about nine and a half million just on that tour. Really big successful tours. He obviously made some of his money back, which was good. So it was a big surprise to people when he ended up releasing uh, his comeback LP, Old Ideas, in 2012, because people weren't expecting it. They expected him to do some live gigs, remember the past, remember some of these classic tracks where I'm gonna play them for you. But no, he, he obviously, his fire had been lit by those live performances and he was ready, he was invigorated and ready to create music once again. So he releases Old Ideas in January of 2012. It's a carefully considered and powerful record that is probably his best thing since 92's The Future. Okay, so you know how I said that Cohen's voice was low in 10 new songs. Okay, so at this point, his voice is pretty much sub-bass in quality. That imperceptible growl is captivating though, and his themes within these songs on old ideas are also captivating. There are themes of love, loss, desperation, depression, all tackled in that signature Cohen way. His personal and funny lyrics on track Going Home prove that he's lost none of his wit or brevity in his later years. I love to speak with Leonard. He's a sportsman and a shepherd. He's a lazy bastard living in a suit. He wants to write a love song, an anthem of forgiving, a manual for living with defeat. The instrumentation yet again changes here from the largely synthetic and keyboard focus since 88's I'm Your Man to a very 
organic acoustic sound which utilizes Hammond organ, piano and violin. The instrumentation here is very grandiose and it really fits Cohen's later years of music. It's something that will go through these last three albums that I discuss. It's got a beautiful grandiose nature to it and it really fits his low, low croon. Darkness is one of my favourite tracks on this album, a subtle but strutting bluesy number with the requisite Hammond organ sounds and a driving drum beat. And I just love Cohen's attitude here when he sings, but I caught the darkness baby and I got it worse than you. After the slow seasoned feeling of old ideas, 2014's Popular Problems came as a massive surprise to me when I listened to it. There's a real fire in his throat from this. It's, you know, it was a, while Old Ideas is a good comeback and it was really interesting, Popular Problems blew it out of the water with this invigorated feeling you could get from his singing and from the instrumentation. I mean, it is his most invigorated performance since 92's The Future. Samson in New Orleans is a lamentation of the disaster New Orleans suffered through Hurricane Katrina, but also a discussion on the social divides that the whole of America is still facing, with Cohen kind of uh, accusing his own God. You said that you were with me. You said that you were my friend. Did you really love the city or did you just pretend? The brilliantly self-aware track Slow is all keyboard bass and Hammond organ with this driving bass drum four to the floor beat and Co Cohen's self-aware poeticism is brilliantly displayed here. I'm slowing down the tune. I've never liked it fast. You want to get there soon. I want to get there last. It's not because I'm old. It's not the life I led. I always liked it slow. That's what my mama said. Now this album takes on the themes of mortality like old ideas does, but also the social themes that I've already discussed. But, but brilliantly here, he's discussing himself getting old. You know, that's, that's what this is, but it, it's that wry, that wry poeticism again, that fatalism, a bit of a knowing wink. And again, that's just what punctures all of his, all of his lyrical themes. There's, there's a bit of a likeness to it, so it's not so doom and gloom. Even though some of his lyricism is focusing on mortality, this album, Popular Problems, also focuses on large themes, a bit like 92's The Future and 88's I'm Your Man and, and going further back than that. He's got tracks like Born a Slave that discusses his Jewish ancestry. You've got tracks like Nevermind with its Arabic backing vocals that is talking about the uselessness of war, but it's also bringing to the fore contemporary wars, such as what's going on in the Middle East at the moment. Basically, this album is such a return to form. I do think it's his best since 92's The Future. I think it's a fantastic album. Um, and it's amazing that he created an album with such cohesion that's so captivating so late on in his career. And now we get to the last Leonard Cohen LP, You Want It Darker, released in October 2016. This truly is a fitting swan song for the dark, wry, intelligent poet who has captivated millions of people since the early 60s. A shadowy, overcast, sparse and moving record for sure. Most of Cohen's vocal performances were recorded with his son Adam at his home and then sent across via email to his musical producers and collaborators. Now, at this point he'd suffered from multiple fractures of the spine and was in quite a lot of pain. So he was confined to his living room whilst making this album and collaborating with people that was somewhere else. This is the kind of album dealing with that weighty subject of death. It's so heavy in its mortality. And much like 2016's Black Star by David Bowie, it's a, it's a record that deals with death and experience, life experience, but there is like a droll doggedness to You Want It Darker, the same as the rest of Cohen's work. It's not all heavy handed and deep and depressing. It has a lightness to it. And despite the heaviness of the, the instrumentation on this record, that still does shine through. He knows that he's had an incredible life and he's here to recollect on those facets of existence, you know, reflect on them and talk about them. On the track On The Level, Cohen sings, Let's keep it on the level. When I walked away from you, I turned my back on the devil, turned my back on the angel too. On the face of these lyrics, it's a relationship that Cohen's choosing to walk away from. But on the, on the double meaning level of that, it's also, he's also choosing to walk away from life. He's ready to let go at this point because he's experienced everything and, and he feels it's the right time. This is expressed clearly, but with intense religious overtones in the title track, You Want It Darker. If you are the dealer, let me out of the game. If you are the healer, 
I'm broken and lame. If thine is the glory, mine must be the shame. You want it darker. This track is so haunting with dry and sparse drums and a driving bass line and the accompaniment of a choir. In fact, it was the uh, Cantor Gideon Zellemeyer and the Shah Hasoshamayan Synagogue Choir. I couldn't have said that without looking at my screen. <laughs> um, but, but what their vocal delivery does, it makes me shiver. It has this ghostly um, spectral presence to it and it just adds even more weight to the subject matter. It adds even more. The grandiose nature I was talking about on old ideas and popular problems, it's here, but it's even more grandiose. Like I'm not a religious person, but the religious tones are just, they're so hefty. You feel like you're in a cold cathedral listening to it almost. If I Didn't Have Your Love is an amazing track. Later on in his career, Cohen had this incredible ability to make listeners hang off every word of his vocal delivery. And this is just highlighted in the really sparse production. It just pushes his vocal delivery to the fore of this song. Really special. In his final moments, reminding everyone that the darkness of life is only brightened with love. And if no leaves were on the tree, and no water in the sea, and the break of day had nothing to reveal, that's how broken I would be. What my life would seem to me if I didn't have your love to make it real. Shortly after this release, Leonard Cohen passed away, but he's left behind a treasure trove of poetry and music to ensure that he will never be forgotten. Cohen himself said that he had no sense of his own work, that he wasn't really one for nostalgia and looking back at his music or writing, which is a fascinating indication of the man, something you wouldn't really expect from an artist writing about the human condition and personal emotional experiences of life. I think it reveals his pragmatism, a peaking optimism and desire to look forward despite the revealing, heartfelt nature of his writing. People are so quick to label him as the lovesick, depressed troubadour, but he was always so much more than that. And that really is it. I don't know what more I can say. The man was a legend and I thought I understood his discography and knew his music, but doing this video has made me obviously go and do some more research and it's just, it's beautiful. He's got so much amazing music and he's, he's quite underappreciated really. Um, more people should be listening to him. He's, he is the definitive poet of the 20th century. Piss off Bob Dylan. <laughs> he is the definitive, in my opinion anyway. Um, but yeah, thanks for watching this video. I've really enjoyed making this. Thank you to everyone who's voted for this video. Make sure you share this with people who love Leonard Cohen or people that want to get into his music. Hopefully this video will help do that. As always, I've done a Spotify playlist with all of the tracks that I've talked about. So link for that's below. Please follow me on Deep Cuts Tweets on Twitter. I'm always tweeting about various things. Uh, I won't be back for a couple of weeks because the next video I put up is the Deep Cuts Best of 2016. So there's quite a lot of work that's got to go into that. So I probably won't put anything up the week after this. Um, but hopefully this video will be enough to sink your teeth into for the time being. But thanks for being here and I'll see you soon.